Welcome everyone. Today is our second lecture, which is very exciting. I want to mention that we are doing this in a, what's called a hybrid. That's that hopefully that you know what that is, a hybrid manner. So we have fewer people here today in, in, in person, but we have a lot more on Zoom. So the flexibility, some people were on Zoom last week and they're live this week and you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. And we love that. In fact, last week, you might be interested to know we had 56 people live and 34 on Zoom. So we had a total of 90 people watching, which we were very excited about. Um, I did want to mention that we're planning another nature walk on Wednesday, September 28th at 1030. And it's going to be down in Shelburne at Meach Cove Farms. Maybe some of you know where All Souls is, was, I think they've been sold. So there's a beautiful walk and hopefully the scenery and the foliage will be perfect that day. Beautiful walk down to the lake and it's supposed to be beautiful, wonderful. So we'll send out an email early next week about it. So if you wanna sign up, you'll, you'll let Betty Naven know. She's the chairman of special events. Uh, please turn off your cell phones. That would be awesome. Now I'd like to introduce Rick Winston. But I have to look at my notes. Um, the topic is Lights, Camera, Action, A History of Montpelier Savoy Theater. Rick founded Montpelier's Art House Cinema, the Savoy Theater, and owned it until 2009 when he retired. Rick will discuss the origins of the theater, some memorable moments, and some of its challenges over the years. Rick is originally from Yonkers, New York, and has lived in adamant Vermont since 1970. He's currently teaching film history on Zoom and in person at the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. He's also the author of Red Scare in the Green Mountains, Vermont in the McCarthy era. So give a warm welcome to Rick Winston. Greetings, everybody. It's great to be back at EEE. I think this is my third time over the last 10 years. Now, I know we, we have uh, one person in the front row who has been to the Savoy Theater over the years. <laughs> How many of you have come to Montpelier and gone to the movies at the Savoy? Okay, maybe, maybe about half. It's still a pretty fascinating story. Anyway, um, Mary got in touch with me about doing this uh, talk without knowing that I was hard at work on a book that's coming out this spring that is uh, about the history of the Savoy Theater and my own life as a movie buff or movie nut, however you want to say. Um, and it's called Save Me a Seat. A life with movies and it's uh i have a if you want to sign up i will let you know uh after the show uh, how to get a hold of a copy when it comes out this spring so um i had a uh, i was going to read part of the preface uh turns out uh my preface is in my computer bag that's holding up the projector so we don't we don't want to do it uh, but uh, I will tell you what, uh, it was kind of giving you a background about how many different strands went into uh, the founding of the Savoy Theater. Uh, and in the preface, I said, I dated, uh, I said, it's now uh, the spring of 2021, which was when I started writing. And my in-person film class at Montpelier has been canceled. But now I'm doing a Zoom film appreciation class. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to be showing. And one of the classes will be about films uh, from a children's point of view. And of course, I would have to include the Italian classic, The Bicycle Thief, which I saw for the first time at uh, summer camp, 19, uh, somewhere around 1957 or 58. I was 13 years old. I never heard of Italian neorealism, but I was so taken with the grittiness 
of this film, which was so unlike Hollywood. So another uh, a Zoom class I was going to do was the films of Burt Lancaster. And I remembered my parents taking me to see Birdman of Alcatraz in Seven Days in May. And uh, some of his later films, like Local Hero in Atlantic City, were some of the first hits at the Savoy Theater in the early 80s. Well, another class was going to be films about the ghosts and supernatural. And, uh, and I was trying to track down a copy of the British uh, film Dead of Night, which I saw in uh, Berkeley, California, when I was a senior at college there. And uh, a supernatural film, which so impressed me. And I made sure that it was the first uh, the inaugural film when I started the Film Society in Montpelier that predated the Savoy. And I was going to have a class about great French actresses, and I was going to have to include Arletti in the film The Children of Paradise, which ever since I was a teenager is one of my favorite films. And at one point, I actually thought I was going to write a book about Children of Paradise, uh, and went to Paris to do some research and was uh, in the Museum of City of Paris called the Carnavalet, actually uh, holding some of the historical artifacts of the real people this film is based on. So I end the, the preface by saying so many films in so many different parts of my life, from childhood to high school to college, and any uh, Anything that uh, involves how the, I got into film and how the Savoy got started has to go back to my parents and especially my father who is a real movie nut. And I have a very vivid memory. I can date it because it was 1958. I was uh, 11 years old. And my father would listen to the news in the morning and then come in and wake my brother and me to go to school. And he would often, you know, give some tidbit that he heard on the news. Um, so uh, this particular day, he came in and said, it's time to get up. Eric von Stroheim died. That was his piece of news from the outside world. The uh, Viennese born actor who is known over his career as the man you love to hate. So I think my, I, I don't know whether I had seen any of his movies, but my father knew that I knew who he was. So I guess I was absorbed a lot from watching uh, TV and old movies. So my parents were movie buffs. They had lived in the Bronx for many years before moving to Yonkers, the great, the great uh, suburban move the, the, uh, after World War II. Anyway, some movies that I remember them taking me to that made such a big impression on me. Probably my first uh, foreign film, Monsieur Hulot's Holiday, it was uh, done by Jacques Tati. Uh, there was a theater in White Plains, New York that showed uh, very classy foreign films. Uh, one New Year's, the first day of 1958, we had a family outing uh, to see Alec Guinness in The Horse's Mouth, and still one of my favorite films, but for completely different reasons than why I liked it as a 11-year-old. Uh, but the film that really um, could say it set me on my life's path, I wouldn't have been able to articulate it at the time. My parents, in their blissful ignorance in um, 1954, they took a seven-year-old to see James Stewart in Rear Window. And um, of course, a lot of it went, went right over my head. But I was thinking, you know, another 10-year-old might have crawled under the seat or said, I can't take this anymore, take me home. But I was totally riveted beginning to end. It was my very first Hitchcock film. And whenever I show it now in any of my film classes or talk about it, I always take a minute to thank my parents who didn't know what they were doing and, and took me to see this movie. So those of, uh, those of us who grew up in the uh, radius of Manhattan had a, 
incredible collection of old movies to see on TV. And especially a show that was on Channel 9, WOR. They played the same movie every night, twice every night, and then once on the weekend afternoons. It was called Million Dollar Movie. And um, my friend who grew up to be a film critic, uh, he said, this made film critics of us, whether we knew it or not, we got into a movie, we said, boy, I wanna see that again. And we saw it every night for a week. And, and or if not the whole movie, said, oh, it's eight o'clock. Charles Lawton is gonna be up in the Tower of Notre Dame. So then when I was in high school and I got, um, was able to go into Manhattan on my own, I had my favorite haunts. Uh, oh, Citizen Kane, of course, one of the movies I watched every night when it was on Million Dollar Movie. Uh, the Bleecker Street Cinema down in Greenwich Village. And then on the Upper West Side, the New Yorker Theater on 88th Street, and there's Alfred Hitchcock playing, uh, paying a visit to theater owner uh, Dan Talbot. Um, and these are the, the New Yorker and the Thalia, both. Uh, Thalia was on West 95th Street. They, um, they were available to me not only through high school, but also my first year, three years of college, which was at uh, Columbia, just a few blocks away. So um, I did, uh, I, long story, but I left Columbia for Berkeley, California to do my senior year at UC Berkeley. And boy, did I get a surprise. If there was any place better than Columbia for the old movies, it was Berkeley. They had about 10 theaters, uh, 10, well, 10 theaters within walking distance of campus, but also 10 or so film societies on campus, each with a specialty, whether it was foreign films or specifically French films, uh, films from the 30s and 40s. Then there was International House that uh, right off campus that showed a great selection of films. So um, I had a great film education in college while I was uh, not studying. <laughs> uh, a sequence of events brought me to Plainfield. I came up to visit some friends from summer camp, wound up um, sticking around. That's Goddard College. I thought I was gonna have a job in the film department, but it did not pan out, but I already, uh, I liked where I was, I was gonna stay. And um, a frequent topic of conversation among my friends who had come to, from Vermont to, from Philadelphia to New York, Boston, says, gee, we just can't go to the movies any night of the week or we want to. And somewhere along the line, 1972, I got an idea to start a once a week film society in Montpelier. Um, that was my mentor at Goddard who wanted me to work in the film department there and help me get this film society started. Gave me all his catalogs, showed me how to order. His name is Walter Unger, uh, still around at age 85 and uh, uh, became quite a well-known independent uh, filmmaker. So the um, film society was in the basement of the Pavilion Auditorium. I don't know how many of you have been to any events, uh, but there was a 200 seat auditorium with fixed seating. And uh, thanks to the Vermont Council on the Arts, they were my sponsor to start this film society. So there's a headline, the film society to have spring series in the Capitol. There's my very first um, program and you can see the very first film is Dead of Night, East of Eden, which I saw at International House in Berkeley, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and my father was a master calligrapher. He, uh, he gladly volunteered to do, to help me design my programs. And then after a few years, it, uh, it really took off and I started to branch out and did a foreign film series at the local high school on another night of the week. 
by the end of the 1970s, it was clear that there was really an audience in Montpelier. And I found myself, um, well, I, I was also experimenting with, you know, how to uh, kind of, uh, kind of engender film culture in Vermont. Okay, you go to the movies to be entertained, but what's, what's behind it? What can you learn from these movies? So here's, um, I reprinted a, an article by one of my favorite critics, Andrew Saris. He says, it is the curse and glory of cinema that its visual oral field is accessible to all viewers indiscriminately, but is still emotionally intimate with each viewer individually. I really like that. A little uh, excerpt from Frank Capra's uh, memoir. Um, this only lasted about five issues. It just got to be too exhausting. But maybe you're familiar with this word zeitgeist. Um, I was a participant in the 70s zeitgeist in central Vermont. There were all kinds of, the, this film society was not the only thing that was happening. Food co-ops, growing co-ops, uh, alternative health uh, uh, centers, alternative newspapers, organic farms. You know, it was the, uh, there was just a, a uh, an exhibit was before the pandemic at the Vermont Historical Society in Barrie about specifically about the 70s and all the, the changes that happened during that period. Um, so what's happening on Montpelier's Main Street? This is an article in our local Times Argus. Um, my brother John had bought this uh, building and still, is still housing the drawing board art supply store. This had been uh, Elmsley the florist. They moved down the street, leaving this empty spot that had um, just great dimensions for a teeny theater. Teeny, like 120 seats. Um, as soon as we uh, announced plans for the theater of uh, local guy who ran the photography studio in Montpelier said, I found this old uh, photo in the basement and uh, here it is. And we had just decided that we were gonna name the theater the Savoy because the landlord of the building who so sold the building to my brother, he came in one day and he said, well, so what are you boys gonna do with this theater? and uh, this space and we said well you know a theater will go in there and he said you know i think my grandfather ran a theater here and i think it was called the savoy so we said that's it okay that'll be the name of our theater we were still and it turned out uh he, his grandfather called it the uh, savoy because they were from the savoia region of the italian alps um so before it was the Savoy, it turned out it was the family, uh, the family theater is called the Masuko uh, Picture Theater. The tenor with the leather lungs, I love that. These films were probably all like five, 10 minutes long. This was 19, this is an ad from 1908 in the uh, evening Argus. And then at some point it changed from the Masuko Moving Picture Theater to the Savoy Theater with an RE. Um, so uh, it had a very rich history. So my brother and I, uh, you know, took over the space, uh, would have been uh, the summer of 1980, planning for a fall or winter opening. And uh, I had made some friends who ran a theater down in Northampton, Massachusetts. And they were, uh, gave us all kinds of great advice about where to get the films, how to negotiate with the, uh, the film distributors, and also very important, where to get your popcorn machine and what kind of candy you're gonna want because it is a well-known fact in the movie business that the concession is 
really is what brings in the uh, the big bucks because um, you have to pay a certain percentage of what you take in for the movies back to the distributor but the concession is all yours um, what you can see up there is um, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Savoy Theater. So that's me and my partner, Gary Ireland. It's an article two months before the theater opened. This was the only movie poster we had on hand, an old Roy Rogers thing we got from an antique store. And uh, you see, we're standing in front of an exposed brick wall, which we had uh, worked on. Uh, and that is the... Uh, uh, the whole right hand side of the theater as you go in. So our very first movie was supposed to be uh, an Australian film called My Brilliant Career with Judy Davis. It had been a big hit like a year before. And as we got closer and closer and closer to day one, it was clear the theater is not going to be open in time. There's just too much work to do. So we had to postpone my brilliant career. And instead, we played Casablanca, which was supposed to be our second film. But because it was our first film and we played it for every anniversary, it has become sort of identified with the theater. Of course, the... Um, the hero of Casablanca, played by Humphrey Bogart, is named Rick. And the play that Casablanca was, uh, was based on was called Everybody Comes to Rick's. There's another reinforcement there. Not that I wanted anything to do with that, but. <laughs> so these are, you see the uh, stamp on the top, Goldberg Brothers. Uh, the Goldberg brothers uh, out of Denver had uh, cornered the market in metal film cans to transport films uh, to such an extent that within uh, a number of years, these cans were known as Goldbergs. So we were waiting for our Goldbergs to arrive with three reels of Casablanca on and one and three reels of Casablanca in the other. Uh, we would go into the uh, projection booth and splice the films together. But we went back, we went to the bus station and we got the Goldbergs and we brought them. And it turned out it was the first three reels of Casablanca and the last three reels of Lenny with Dustin Hoffman. And our person at, uh, uh, at, the, at United Arts says, oh, this never happens. Believe me, this never happens. So we had, our, we had our opening with Casablanca, some of the early movies we played, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, uh, Gary the Wrath of God, finally, My Brilliant Career. And we found out pretty early on that people loved Australian and New Zealand films. They were foreign, but they were in English. They were beautifully shot. They were accessible. Um, and uh, we found to our great surprise that all we had to do is say a film was from Australia, New Zealand, and the crowds would show up. Uh, Break of Morant, though, though it takes place in uh, South Africa, was an Australian film. This is from New Zealand, uh, Smash Palace, a domestic drama. Richard Chamberlain in, in The Last Wave, a um, uh, a supernatural thriller directed by Peter Weir. I love this movie. Norman Kay and Wendy Hughes in Lonely Hearts. Uh, search it down if you uh, are so inclined. We also found that we were doing great with some really oddball documentaries. This is a movie about the making of a Tibetan sand mandala. We got uh, everybody from every Buddhist community in Northern Vermont <laughs> lining the, the street. Uh, a biography, uh, a, a documentary about the life of Carl Jung. And uh, anything that had to do with Tibet and Nepal guaranteed to draw a crowd. 
Yeah, so this is a documentary about the ones, the nomadic workers who gather the, all the salt off the Tibetan steppes. Um, a uh, canoe journey but done by a, a, a Canadian, uh, about a Canadian canoeist named Bill Mason. And then little did we know, this is, this is the, the uh, vicissitudes of history. We opened the theater in 1980 and all of a sudden the birth of the American indie movement just happened to coincide with our opening. So uh, Jim Jarmusch's movie, Stranger Than Paradise, Spike Lee's first movie, She's Gotta Have It, and uh, John Sayles' first movie, Return of the Sukkaka Seven. And we had our first major guest as a result of Sukkaka Seven, because uh, John Sayles went to Williams College and he cast his movie almost entirely with friends from Williams and somebody else from Williams lived in Montpelier who said, oh, why don't I get my friend Bruce McDonald to come in and talk about the movie? So that was a big thrill. And over the years, we've had more guests, David Mamet and Lindsey Krauss when they still lived in the area. Uh, of course, Fred Tuttle and uh, John O'Brien behind him who made uh, The Man with the Plan and, and, and other movies. That was, that was a very thrilling. We didn't get Rip Torn himself, but Jay Craven has been uh, at our theater many times with his films. By the time of this film, where the river runs through, uh, where the rivers flow north by Howard Frank Mosher, by the time the movie was done, Jay didn't care if he ever saw Rip Torn again in his life. So <laughs> those stories could fill a book. Anyway, so there became another category of film that uh, was a mainstay at the Savoy. And uh, we found out very early that if a movie came out from Columbia, Paramount, uh, the Universal, the five major studios, we wouldn't have a chance at getting it. They all, they all had contracts with the theater down the street of first refusal. So there's no way we were gonna play Dances with Wolves or any of the big hits. But the films that flopped, that were done by major studios, they had right of first refusal and they refused. And we picked them up and incredibly wonderful movies that were deemed by the studios to be flops. And uh, this uh, writer put a name to it, Produced and Abandoned. And this is, a, this is an anthology of uh, movies from the 70s and 80s that critics have write, written about saying, why didn't anybody see this movie? It was so wonderful. So a few of them were uh, Harry Dean Stanton uh, and Emilio Estevez and Repo Man. Uh, River's Edge with Keanu Reeves. Uh, yet again, we're bashing our heads against the wall. How do we get teenagers to come to the Savoy? Oh, show a movie about teenagers. Nope, that didn't work. It was a teenager. It's a movie about teenagers that was meant for adults. Um, so we never did lick that problem of getting teenagers to the movies. One of our wonderful young concessionaires. Uh, she was. Uh, a high school student. I said, Sophie, how, so how do we get you and your friends to come? To, to? She said, well, I hate to break it to you, but my friends have been programmed to want to see crap. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we gave up on that. Um, another movie was Burt Lancaster. It was terrific. Diane Lane and Amanda Plummer as a, uh, a really wonderful Western. Cutter's Way with John Hurd and Jeff Bridges. And a really lovely film called Dream Child, the story of the real um, Alice in Wonderland, Alice Hargreaves and her relationship with Lewis Carroll uh, with animation by Jim Henson. It's uh, quite a special film. Well, we were losing money year after year 
um, with these movies that weren't quite getting enough attendance. This is a headline from 1986. And uh, several things had happened since we opened. The, our competition down the street, first they twinned, and then they quadrupled, and then they, they left it at five. But, uh, and then the whole video explosion that happened in the early 80s. So we were really, really struggling. And we took our problem to a dear friend of ours named David Wise, who um, uh, had a long career in marketing. And we said, well, we're thinking of sending out a letter to our, you know, all our members saying, oh, no, no. And he said, don't send a letter. He said, close. If you send a letter to your mailing list, they're the only ones who are gonna know you're in trouble. Close, it'll be on the front page of the paper and say, if you can't raise an, this amount of money, if you can raise this amount of money in a month, we'll reopen. And David working with us devised a membership structure designed for the people who, uh, they may not be able to come to the movies, but they want us to be there when they do come. So that really saved the Savoy. And uh, our accountant was flabbergasted year after year. The difference between losing money and breaking even was exactly what we took in in membership. Um, so it's still a, a very vital part of keeping the Savoy going. So there we are, we reopened a month later and, uh, and didn't have another uh, existential crisis for a long time. And if you can't beat them, join them. Uh, in 1989, we opened our own uh, video store. The Savoy had a big empty basement. The bathrooms were down there and some people actually confessed to us that they didn't want to go to the bathroom down there because the room was so creepy. So we, we had the, the, the space and, uh, and our friends down at Pleasant Street in Northampton, they had opened their own video store. And they said, don't worry about it. People will take out videos five nights of the week. And then on the sixth, they'll come to the movies. And that's, that's sort of what happened. So we had a very curated, selection of the movies that we liked and wanted other people to see and foreign movies and documentaries. And this time we could get movies like Dances with Wolves, you know, buy five copies and let them pay for the foreign movies that uh, only went out once a week. It's an article from our 10th anniversary of the Savoy. Um, and but then 1992, and you'll have many of you remember the big flood in Montpelier. That's what it looked like. And this is what the video store looked like. Fortunately, the flood happened at seven in the morning and not at five in the morning. Enough people were out and our faithful projectionist, Chris Wood, noticed the river was running the wrong way from his apartment. He said, the video store. And he rushed down and he grabbed a human chain off the street to take all our drawers containing the actual films. But this is what the floor of the video store looked like. Uh, but um, because the, our stock was not uh, destroyed, we were able to rebuild the store and open again after two months. This man's name is Jeffrey Jacobs, um, not to be confused with a landlord in Montpelier named Jeffrey Jacobs. Um, he's somebody I knew from film society days and he had become a, what's known in the trade as the, a film buyer. He was the go between, between theaters and distributors. And I was doing my own booking of the films and it, I was on the way to getting an ulcer because these, really high powered businessman and I didn't know how to negotiate. And Jeffrey said, let me do it for you. Of course, for a fee, but uh, it paid off quite quickly. We were able to get films like Howard's End, The Crying Game, 
and all through the 90s, some really terrific, it was, uh, I spoke to Jeffrey recently and he said, those years from 92 to 99 or so, a real, there, there were so many good films um, and uh, distributors were, uh, were getting enough money back on these films like Howard's End and Crying Games that they could afford to take chances on, on other films. Well, another big uh, development that happened to us in the late 90s was the Green Mountain Film Festival. Ha anybody go down to Montpelier for this while, while it was still going on? Um, we had formed a uh, nonprofit organization called Focus on Film in our struggling days. So, well, maybe if, the Savoy itself couldn't become a nonprofit after being a profit uh, business, but we could at least form a like Friends of the Library, that kind of thing. So they uh, focus on film sponsored all kinds of really unusual uh, film events. And um, this was our first big one in 1985, the week of uh, Yiddish language films. But the uh, focus on film had been dormant and until um, uh, put on a, a LGB in those days, that's where it stopped. Um, uh, two festivals in Montpelier that, that were sponsored by focus. But um, the, the festival, the focus on film was dormant until uh, our friend Chris Wood, the projectionist who, who uh, saved us during the flood. He said, uh, gee, how about we uh, do a film festival? And uh, can't quite see, but we had great, great events. Uh, Les Blank, the documentary filmmaker, interviewed by Mark Greenberg. And here I am uh, interviewing the NPR film critic, Kenneth Turan. We um, <clears throat> showed uh, spectacular movies, uh, and this is my wife, Andrea Sirota. Uh, in 1999, my original partner, Gary Ireland, uh, moved to Seattle, and Andrea and I became a kind of a mom and pop operation. She was uh, running the video store, but we would book the uh, films at the film festival together, and it was a real high point. Well, we started noticing during the, during, uh, the years from 2000 to 2000 nine when we sold the theater that uh, audiences just were, things were really tailing off. And the only movies that were hits for us were some of the few were movies starring Judy Dench or Judy Dench and Maggie Smith <laughs> or Helen Mirren. Uh, it was like the, the, these, uh, these stately English ladies were our uh, answer to Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. You know, they were the ones who were going to get our audiences. And I had a very telling conversation with a fellow theater owner who ran the theater in Rhinebeck, New York. And we were showing the Queen and having great crowds, and he was showing the Queen having great crowds. And uh, he said, Yeah, you know, at this rate, I don't know who's going to die first, us or our audience. <laughs> and it was just such a telling comment that we were not, um, that new audience was not coming in. It's a, it's a, a syndrome that's really, you can see it in the classical music world even more. You know, who's, who's going to be those new audiences? So in 2009, um, Andrea decided, uh, Andrea and I decided that we were going to sell the theater and we found a, a buyer. It's now um, has yet another owner for the last five years, James O'Hanlon. Here we are the, uh, celebrating our 25th anniversary. And this is, uh, for those of you who have never been there, this is what the theater likes. That's the exposed um, brick wall on the side, very intimate. 
And um, I wish that heating duct going down the, the uh, ceiling, we had never been there because <laughs> we could raise the seed screen even higher and have more legible subtitles, but that's what we had to deal with. Well, that is, uh, that, that is a kind of a galloping history of um, the Savoy, what led up to it and what our challenges have been. And uh, once again, I'll say if you, if you wanna read a lot more about the Savoy uh, or about my life going to the movies, uh, you can sign that uh, notebook and I'll let you know in March or April when it comes out. But for now, I'm really happy to take your questions. Wonderful, thank you. Now you can, <laughs> now you can hear me. Okay, before we start with questions, I do wanna remind our Zoom audience, please, that you can go on your Zoom and where it says Q&A, type in your questions. We have Kathy Chamberlain is looking for those so that we can alternate questions between you and our live audience. So let's see, Kathy, how many do we have? Well, I only have one. One so far, that's not good. Come on, people. <laughs> So please, okay, so why don't we start with someone in the live audience? Anyone have questions? Okay. Yes. As a boy in Burlington, uh, we had three dedicated uh, movie creators to Majestic, the strong, and the friend. The only one survives now at the performance uh, site. Uh, I'm wondering in the Montpelier Valley area, uh, is there any surviving creative buildings, no matter what the what are they used for? Yeah. Um. <clears throat> I actually went to the movies at the Strong a few times before it, it burned down, right, in the early 70s. Yeah. Um, the, cap <coughs> the Capitol Theater down the street has been the Capitol for a really long time. I think to the late 40s. I know that there had been a theater on Main Street on the second floor, um, long gone because uh, the landlord um, one time approached us saying, hey, I was cleaning out the attic there and I found these beautiful old projectors, yeah, you know, only good for curiosity items. In uh, Barry, um, there was just the one theater, the Paramount, and I know they go back to at least the 1950s, because that's where, um, you know, the, the Alfred Hitchcock film, Trouble with Harry, that was shot partially in Crassberry Common. Uh, Hitchcock came up for the uh, premiere at the Paramount. So there, there are photos of that theater then. So um, as far as other theaters in Barrie, I don't know about that. Where was the Majestic? Okay, I can I can find out easily enough. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Got it. Yep. Can you hear me? Here we go. Here's a question. What is your favorite film? Uh -huh. <clears throat> well, I come prepared for that one. <laughs> um. I um. We saw a little um, still from it. It's the French film, Children of Paradise. Anybody else seen it? Mm -hmm. To share my opinion? It, it, it's a pretty rich film. It's the, I think it's the closest thing that film has come to a big, thick 
19th century novel that you're sorry to see end. So uh, that's a film I go back to every few years. I still love to see uh, Rear Window again and again and again. I um, read uh, something by one of my favorite film critics, David Thompson, who said, I've seen it 25 times and it's never less fresh than a Meyer lemon. <laughs> um, as far as comedies, I love uh, one with Henry Fonda and Barbara Stanwyck called The Lady Eve from the early 40s. All right, that'll, that'll be enough. <laughs> Was there any film that really caught you by surprise by being an absolute smash hit, turning them away at the door? And well, uh, you you actually said the uh, remember Groucho with the duck that came down onto the ceiling. You said the word smash. It was that New Zealand film, Smash Palace. Uh -oh. We couldn't understand it. You know, it didn't have any recognizable stars. And it was a really uh, <clears throat> rough movie. And I remember, uh, you know, the night it opened and I was having dinner at a friend's house and called to, and they said, what? We had turned people away. I said, I, I couldn't understand. I, that's when we knew we were really onto a thing with those down under films. Uh, unfortunately, it usually went the other way. Things that we, really hoped and felt would appeal to a large part of the audience. And there was a, uh, there was a great quote from, uh, it was o Oscar Hammerstein, the lyricist, his father had been a Broadway producer. And he said, uh, the producer said, it turns out that the, uh, number of people who will not attend any given event is infinite. <laughs> they wanted to put that on a sampler and hang it somewhere. Yeah, thanks, that was a good question. Here's another one from our Zoom. In your opinion, has the quality of film become greater or lesser over the years? Um, <clears throat> I think there are still really wonderful movies being made. Uh, they're hard, they're getting harder to see. You, ha you have to do more searching out. Um, we noticed over the years at the Savoy that they, uh, the piece of the pie occupied by subtitle films that got released in America was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And who could blame a distributor for not wanting to take a chance uh, on, on a movie that only had a, a guaranteed kind of ceiling uh, audience. But now I am seeing movies that are released uh, via Netflix, films from Morocco and France and you know, and some American indies that are very good. So I think the, the um, how shall I put it? Um, I think there are more, uh, there are as many good films, but there are more bad films. Um, there are, there are, um, the marketing imperatives in the American studio system are such that, you know, really good, thoughtful films that were a staple of Hollywood in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Um, uh, and and even, even some of these produced and abandoned films, you know, the, there used to be the, the studio would say, Okay, well, this film might only take in so much, but that's still, you know, 10 times more than it will cost to make. Let's go ahead and do it. Now they won't do that unless the film is going to be guaranteed to make 50 times as much, which means that they have to focus on that, you know, 10 to 15 year old boy demographics. And uh, I don't know, it, it's a pretty depressing scene. 
I've been interested in the course that you're teaching in Montpelier. Was it through the um, senior center and could we get hooked up with that somehow? Yeah, uh, yes, actually, uh, I am, um, you know, this, uh, this, the Zoom thing was in response to the pandemic that you couldn't do in-person classes. Well, now I'm doing in-person classes again, but the Zoom class still has, you know, 60 to 70 attendees every semester. So I'm, I'm doing it. Um, I'll set up another piece of paper here. If you wanna get information on my Zoom class, that's every Thursday morning, starting in two weeks. Um, yeah. Okay. There, as somebody says, if it's Zoom, there's room. <laughs> yeah. Here's a two part question. Oh. Are there any Canadian films that you felt were exceptionally noteworthy? And has the Savoy ever had a Canadian film festival? Mm, we have not had a Canadian film festival as such, but we have featured um, over, over the years, uh, Quebecois films and films from um, uh, on Ontario, Canadian made. Uh, one that was a big hit for us, you know, going back to your question, things that surprised us. There's a Canadian movie called Ticket to Heaven. It was about the family's attempts, a fictional film, uh, but based on true events, family uh, to extract their son from a Mooney type uh, religious cult. Yeah, excellent film. I don't know if it's found anywhere. I love the, the uh, Quebecois films of the director, Denise Arcand, like Jesus of Montreal. That did uh, really well for us. So uh, yeah, it's very frustrating. They're they're just they're just up there, and you know hardly any of the films get uh, a good distribution here. I'm enjoying this immensely, so thank you. And uh, um, if you have an opinion, do you would you have a recommendation of where on the streaming services you can find the best? movies like whether you would choose netflix are there any obscure ones that you personally use that's an easy question to answer anybody subscribe to a criterion channel okay um criterionchannel.com they have the best selection of foreign films older american films you want to have your own Ingmar Bergman festival at home or uh, obscure Japanese Indian films. And there's usually a commentary, uh, there are interviews with other people. You could, you could really never leave your house again, but that's the <laughs> downside. Um, I don't know if the libraries around here have Canopy with a K, K-A-N-O-P-Y. It's a free streaming service through your library. They have a great collection. Anyone else? So if you all did not have pencil and paper, because how many wonderful things has he told us? Start next week. Oh. <laughs> so next Thursday at 2 o'clock, right, Travis? Yes, on CCTV, and you should see in the emails that you all get from us, the one you got this week from us, it'll tell you how you can watch next week online on TV this very program. So bring, so do that and look at all the films you have. Oh, oh my goodness, you won't ever leave the house, but I don't know that that's a good idea. We've done that for too many years. <laughs> but the idea is please, please do watch this again. And by the way, Travis Washington is our fabulous, fabulous guy from CCTV. Yay! And Rick, thank you so much again. This has been wonderful. Just, just terrific. Thank you, everyone on Zoom. Thank you, everyone live. We'll see you next week.